In 9th century Baghdad, the city was founded in 750. That was covered, I didn't read last night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were doing that. And then the Beit al Hikmah in 830. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah, yeah. House of Knowledge, House of Wisdom. That's 830, and I'll talk about that. And then, of course, the Mongol invasion in 1258. And even with this one, there was a chronicler who said there wasn't a cat left in the city by the time the Mongols were done with this place. And there was another chronicler who talked about the hoofs of the horses being stained red because blood was just flowing through the streets so much. And that the uh, Euphrates and the Tigris rivers were both, you know, because people were fleeing and they were slaughtering them and throwing them into the rivers. So they were saying, they said the rivers filled red. So that was a lovely saying. Um, so that is going to become the center of world trade, keep in mind at this point. And when I say world trade, the known world, but Baghdad is right in the middle. If you look like China, through Asia, and up into Europe, Baghdad is almost, not actually first more centrally located, but Baghdad is the place that where all the trade is happening. Um, and then also it's going to become the center of world scholarship in their known world. The new world hasn't even been discovered yet, so I'm talking about the Eurasian um, area right here. Oh, and then the Battle of Talash River in 751, one year after the city is founded. That, um, who knows if it's real, but there's like this legend, the story that they kept, that the um, Muslims captured Chinese paper makers. But we do know that after that battle, paper entered the Islamic world, and that should never be underestimated. Because you're looking at moving from parchments and animal skins, which is a real pain to, to develop, to create, and to write on, onto paper. And now suddenly things are flowing. And by the way, books didn't exist. They had manuscripts. They didn't have like bound books yet. So rolled up manuscripts, tied in the leather strip. So when people say this one wrote 282 books, it was really 282 manuscripts. And one of them might be equivalent to two pages in a modern book today, but it's important. If it's something about the development of the eye, you know, the human development, something about that, it's important. Even though it's like two pages long by today's standards. Um, and then, here, I just put this on. Here's our bag, Dad. This. So you've got the, the trade. You're just coming in from Central Asia, coming in down here. And then um, they, uh, I'm sorry, here's Mecca. And then here's Baghdad over here. So they're kind of like in the middle of everything. The trade routes are coming along through here. And oh, okay, and then I wanted to put that up just to remind you that a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about today is in that book. So, and there's three, two or three copies in the library here too. And Susan, as I said, Susan right here, she's coming Sunday. Um, okay, one of the things in this book that I do to, uh, to look at trade, and I, do you have that? Did I give that to you? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we really don't have time to do this right now, but one of the things I do is I have my students go down that list, and I say, so what, how can you categorize things? You know, what categories are you seeing here? And they come up with stuff like food, weapons, luxury goods. Um, one of them came up with... Um, animals that are useful and another one the animals that aren't useful like peacocks. <laughs> you don't need a peacock. Yeah. <laughs> so you know sort of luxury animals. And then I have them these are some of the things they come up with. Exotic animals, useful animals, luxury items, food, battle gear. And then they I they actually put these into lists. And this is what they came up with. Elephants being exotic and useful. Both. You know, like here's peacocks, giraffes, okay? These are actual animals that you can use. Luxury items, they come up with ruby silk, fur, porcelain, gold utensils, pearls, lots of food. By the way, Iran, 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 which is ironic. I mean, I used to, I used to be married to an Iranian and they're obsessed with food. And so when I saw this list, I went, got it, okay, <laughs> got it. Um, battles, battle gear, which was a lot of that was from Central Asia. And then, what we don't like to talk about in, you know, in public and in polite society is the trade of humans. And that was one of the primary trade items along the Silk Road. So they were looking at that and found silver players, engineers, agronomists, marble workers. And then I also asked them this question, what can you infer about the regions from where these items came? And of course they get that Central Asia is providing a lot of the weaponry, China is providing a lot of the luxury items. And that tells you something about the society right there. Okay, um, Baghdad as center of scholarship. 
One of the things with the development of the Beit HaHikmah, the House of Wisdom in 830 in Baghdad, what they purposely did is they said, we're going to gather scholars, and we're going to send them out, we're going to have them gather what they can in terms of knowledge of the world. We're going to have a gathering together of knowledge. And get it where you can. We don't care if it comes from China. We don't care if it comes from India. We don't care if it comes from the Greeks. Get it. And bring it here. So they actually, what happened is they started the whole translation movement, starting at the library at the Beit al-Hikmah, the House of Wisdom. And then that's going to develop. And then when the Mongols come in and they slaughter everybody, those who survive head to Spain. And then Spain is going to be the place where the people from Northern Europe are going to come down to study that and take it back up again. Um, write the name, yeah, the name Ben Ishak was a Nestorian uh, Christian, and he was the first director of the Beit al Hikmah. And so you have, again, the Syriac language coming in, and knowledge of the Nestorians, who are primarily coming from the Byzantine world, lots of connection with the Greeks, um, are being persecuted, so they head east because they know that if they move to an area under the Muslim world, they're going to be left alone. If they stay in the Byzantine world, they're going to be killed because they were considered a Christian heretic, heretical group. Um, what ends up happening is this competition starts amongst the Muslim rulers, and that competition is support for scholarship. And one of the scholars themselves wrote, it seemed as if all the world, from the caliph down to the humble citizens, suddenly became students. In quest of knowledge, men traveled over three continents and returned home like bees laden with honey to impart the precious stores which they had accumulated to crowds of eager disciples. So you have people suddenly trying to get involved in this. 